Welcome to Electrified, it's your host Dylan Loomis. Quick shout out to my newest patron, Tim W. Thank you for choosing to support the channel. First up today, we get a small Tesla mobile app update, but as you can see, you now have media control features, again, from the mobile app showing you what's playing in the car, presumably allowing you to control it from outside of the car. And if you continue to scroll down, you'll also have navigation with some more detail. So, of course, it's good to see somewhat regular and useful updates when it comes to the mobile app. Here we have Phil LeBeau sharing a new and updated United States EV market share chart through the first three quarters of this year. As always, when it comes to Tesla, this metric doesn't really matter that much. The one to focus on is Tesla's market share of the overall auto market. However, I do like to look at this to see what the rest of the competition is doing behind Tesla. And somewhat surprisingly, Hyundai still outselling Ford. And then of course we have VW. And that means yes, GM is relegated to the other category still for now. Next up, Monroe Live released a quick video about Tesla removing the ultrasonic sensors, basically just confirming what we already know, but they did share this chart showing us that per car, removing these sensors when you factor in everything, the sensor itself, the wiring, the harness, etc., saves about $114 per car. Doing the math on 2 million cars per year, maybe for 2023, that's $228 million saved. And like I said in a prior video, I'm actually more excited about the speed of production being able to remove all of those processes. Next up, in what should be a surprise to no one, Tesla's going to be the first to implement some new safety technology specifically for disabled vehicles on the road. Tesla doing this in a deal with emergency safety solutions. Going to their website, their solution called Help gives oncoming drivers significant advanced warning of disabled and vulnerable vehicles on the road ahead. This Help technology combines highly visible emergency-based flash rates of the vehicle lighting and digital notifications sent to other vehicles and GPS-based mapping applications. So this technology is twofold. The disabled vehicle will flash its lights in a very conspicuous and visible way, a faster flash rate, and it will actually send GPS pings basically to traffic in the area using GPS mapping system so drivers in that area are alerted of the disabled vehicle ahead. And while this might not be the sexiest topic ever, these disabled vehicles on the road are actually a pretty big problem and unfortunately cause a lot of accidents and deaths. This is data from the ESS website. 72,000 people affected every year, 15,000 killed or injured, and those deaths and injuries add up to a societal cost of around $9 billion every year. And the ESS CEO said Tesla is a leader in bringing first-time innovation to passenger vehicles and is leading the way by implementing this help technology. Scroll down a little bit further. Tesla will be adding this to a range of its vehicles, but no timeline given just yet. Here we have some people talking about this today. We reported on this a few weeks ago. Green, the only, the Tesla software hacker, basically found this tweet and he said there may be a special setting in the code that Tesla uses for these testing agencies, the safety agencies. Well, the Euro NCAP did look into it and they just said so far their investigations have not revealed any evidence of an attempt to cheat the tests by Tesla. Next up, we have Doug Lewin who is very involved in the clean energy space in Texas. He's saying there's a task force working to get this virtual power plant pilot started their meeting and they're going to vote on this on October 18th. And for us, he said this virtual power plant pilot with an 80 megawatt cap slated to begin January 3rd, 2023, likely to see participation from at least Tesla, Sunrun, Generac, and a few others. There will be a live stream of one of these meetings for this VPP in Texas. Maybe we'll learn why there's a cap, to what degree Tesla will be involved. So hopefully we get some more information at some point tomorrow. Next up, we have this video that is causing some headlines saying that a Tesla semi was broken down on the highway. I'm just sharing this because the reality is we really have no idea what's actually going on as far as I can tell. This semi driver saw it, stopped, took this video. The Tesla semi is seemingly stopped. There is a mobile service van right here. There is a tow truck involved for some reason. But as you can see, there is another semi right here that went off the road. So maybe they got into an accident or the semi was trying to avoid the Tesla semi. 
Point being, we don't know what happened. It may not be broken down. Even if it is, it's not the end of the world, but I just wanted to pass along in case you see all of these headlines. There's no real confirmation that the Tesla Semi was broken down. Here we have a study done by the IIHS going over some habits and attitudes when it comes to regular people using ADAS systems. We won't spend much time here though because of this. The method for this study is a phone and online survey. So this is basically self-reported data for about 200 different people using GM's Super Cruise, Nissan and Infiniti's Pro Pilot, and of course, Tesla Autopilot. The main results, which really should come as no surprise, all three groups reported being more likely to engage in non-driving related activities, using your cell phone, makeup, eating, whatever, while using their systems, then while driving unassisted. The study did conclude Super Cruise users were most likely and Pro Pilot Assist users least likely to think that secondary activities were safer to perform while using the ADAS systems. And this last point is pretty interesting. 53% of the Super Cruise users, 42% of Autopilot, and 12% of Pro Pilot Assist indicated they were comfortable treating their systems as self-driving. So I think this is good to be aware of. Next up, we have BMW looking to follow in Tesla's footsteps when it comes to in-car infotainment, specifically looking to add gaming to its vehicles. They have partnered with a company named Air Console. However, their implementation will not require gaming controllers. Users will be able to use a smartphone. A separate article from Autoblog said BMW is looking to have this implemented in 2023. And that Air Console gaming requires computing capabilities which are only met with a hardware update of the head unit, which is first available in the new 7 series and will be rolled out to further models next year. And if you go to Air Console's website, Website. This is the landing page. So as you can see, the smartphone will definitely interact with the screen in the BMW vehicles to play these games. Now, I'm not sure how many of these games will be immediately available in the BMW iteration of this technology, but you kind of get an idea. They have up to 180 different games depending on the platform. Next up this morning, we got the producer price index. So won't spend much time here. Just want to give you an overview of what this is, what it means and where we go from here. Simply put, this data just measures the change in prices paid by businesses. It is published monthly and it's subject to one revision that is then published four months later. This is widely considered to be the first major inflation number that comes out every month. The PPI measures changes in prices that manufacturers and wholesalers actually pay for goods during various stages of production. So naturally, any indications of inflation here could eventually be transmitted to the retail level or the CPI, which we'll get tomorrow. It's really pretty simple. If a business has to pay more for goods, that business is more likely to pass on those higher costs, ultimately to the end consumer. The PPI does actually have indexes for three different stages of production though. It's crude goods, intermediate goods, and finished goods. The one that economists pay the most attention to is the PPI for finished goods. That's because it represents the final stage of processing right before those goods are actually shipped to wholesalers and retailers. So of course, prices at that last stage of production will be determined by cost pressures and counted in the two prior stages, the crude and intermediate stages. Quickly for the crude stage, just think of raw materials entering the market for the first time. The intermediate stage just reflects the cost of commodities that have undergone transitional processing before becoming a final product. And compared to the CPI, the PPI does not take into account the price of most services. Whereas with the CPI, services like housing and medical care make up more than half of the index. And just like the CPI, the Fed and the investment community are closely watching the core PPI, a measure that excludes food and energy. And just so you know how they get this data, every month the Labor Department receives answers to questionnaires requesting prices on about 100,000 different items from around 30,000 different firms around the country. Which commodities are 
selected for this basket of goods and what weight they're given for the PPI actually depends on how much revenue these goods are generating in the economy. And typically the weights are reviewed and modified around every five years or so. And for the September results, they came in higher than expected. The print was up 0.4% in September and the expectation was 0.2%. So I don't want to get too detailed here and the core reading for the PPI did basically come in in line with expectations, but the bigger number is of course tomorrow with the CPI data. Shifting back to EVs, we have a Toyota exec who kind of went off the cuff and had some stern remarks to the audience. I looked for a video but could not find it. He was basically presenting to an Australian audience and he was supposed to just introduce a new Toyota for that market. So here are some of these comments from Sean Hanley from Toyota. To be honest, some of this belief that you can just go full electric in 10 years in this country and satisfy the owners and what they want to do with cars is a very difficult proposition. And I personally didn't see the video, but this journalist made it sound like Sean Hanley actually left the podium and got pretty animated in saying the following comments. In October 2001, how many car companies were even talking about battery electric cars and how many of them launched hybrids? I'll help you answer it. Two, Honda Insight, on and off the market for various reasons twice, pulled out of the market. But of course now electric cars have suddenly become trend setting. Well, I'd suggest we played a role in reducing carbon emissions 21 years ago, not three years ago when it became trendy. We're not standing in the way of electrification, we just wanted to let you know what is happening. The point I'm trying to make here is, what aren't you seeing that I'm seeing? Toyota is not stopping, lagging, or preventing electric cars. Toyota also said based on its calculations that the emission reduction from three hybrids is on par with that of one battery electric car. And back to Hanley, he said, the 300,000 hybrids we've sold so far are equivalent to introducing approximately 90,000 EVs to the market. So clearly internally, some of the Toyota executives have had enough of the media and journalists questioning its commitment to electrification. And it's become just as clear that despite all of that pushback, Toyota is still committed to not committing to full battery electric vehicles. Next up, we have Mercedes and Microsoft now teaming up to try to speed up production for Mercedes using cloud-based software. This partnership is intended to improve production efficiency at over 30 different passenger car plants globally, will also be launched in the US and China, and they wanna gather data across the production process from components to logistics to the assembly line to create a virtual replica that allows teams to identify potential supply chain bottlenecks more quickly Collaboration should lead to a 20% increase in vehicle production efficiency by 2025 compared to today. I actually did a video specifically about this months ago talking about how Tesla has its own operating software, again, that it created to manage the business. It doesn't use typical enterprise resource planning software off the shelf. Pair that with its agile manufacturing system and Tesla just set up for success and everyone else trying to catch up. Here we have a quick note on Lucid from CNBC. Lucid produced 2,282 cars in the third quarter, delivered 1,398 during the quarter. So clearly still slow going for Lucid, but they did confirm they're on track for their between six and 7,000 production target for this year. Next up, the Polestar 3. Polestar's first electric SUV made its official debut today. I watched the event. Here are my takeaways. Polestar quietly has 67,000 EVs on the road today. Now with the Polestar 3, they made a big focus on the audio system. They're partnered with Bowers and Wilkins and they have 28 speakers in this car in including speakers in the headrest. They are Dolby Atmos enabled, and this will be a very immersive audio experience. They partnered with Cabin Air for a HEPA filter of sorts, just like Tesla. Of course, the Polestar 3 will have cameras, radars, ultrasonic sensors, and LiDAR from Luminar will be available in quarter two, 2023. I'm sure many people wish the Model Y had this, but the air suspension will be standard on the three, so it'll change your ride height depending on the speed you're traveling. The three will have an option for 22 inch wheels and this vehicle will have a ground clearance of around 9.8 inches. Polestar did briefly touch on cleaning devices and heating to actually keep the sensors and the cameras clean, but they didn't give much detail for how they were going to do that. 
The 3 will have interior LED lighting and it will use Google's Android OS infotainment system that should be pretty customizable. We're looking at a 111 kilowatt hour battery pack for about 300 miles of EPA rated range up to 250 kilowatts in terms of charging, but of course we only really care about the charging curve, TBD. This vehicle will have soft closing doors, a heads up display. It'll start around 89,000 euros with the Pilot and the Plus pack included, and the Performance pack will be an extra 6,600 euros. Remember right now the conversion to USD is basically one to one. Production set to begin middle of 2023 and delivery in Q4 2023. Many of you know I'm a big Polestar fan. It's definitely my second favorite EV company behind Tesla. They just pay attention to detail. They're focused on sustainability, where they're getting all of their materials. Not that I could ever see myself actually getting a car that's not a Tesla, but if I was in the market for a car in this price range, this would be squarely on the list of vehicles to check out. Hope you guys have a wonderful day. Please like the video if you did, and a huge thank you to all of my Patreon supporters.